for today's video we're going to take a look at a 1973 Dictaphone Ultravox dictation machine, model number U401. This story starts back in time when I was a kid. There used to be a stall on my local market that sold electrical and electronic components. They also sold faulty, obsolete or otherwise redundant electronic equipment. It was like a toy shop for someone who liked buying stuff to take apart to find out how it worked. One day I saw on the stall this bright orange machine of mystery. How could I resist? It was bright orange after all. Anyway, I took it home and I think I realised that I didn't really know how to get it going, but I did know it needed a microphone. So on another trip to the stall, I bought this dictaphone microphone. Not the right one for the machine, but I thought maybe it could be modified to work with it. That wasn't the case, but the thought was there. We'll actually see that microphone in a future video, because I have now got the machine to go with that. Anyway, rather luckily, this particular machine didn't get taken apart to find out how it worked. It just got put in a box and forgotten about for a number of years. Sometime recently, I rediscovered the Ultravox and really fancied getting it going. So the search started to try and find not only the microphone, but more importantly, the recording sheet or sound sheet. I searched on eBay and antique shops and vintage stalls, but nothing really came up. I did manage to find this Ultravox microphone, which I hope might do the trick. But it turns out this is for a Packer Ultravox, which was a version of the Ultravox sold under license by Packer in America. This one has a 10-pin rectangular socket, and I actually need a 9-pin oval socket for my machine. I thought that I might be able to modify this microphone to work, but I didn't know the correct pin out of the original microphone to know which pins I needed to connect. And besides, I still didn't have a sound sheet to record onto, so the search continued. Anyway, I did eventually find a website with an Ultrafox, complete with a microphone and one sound sheet. It was at a second-hand shop in France, so I contacted them with the help of Google Translate, only to find out that they don't ship to the UK. We spent some time communicating and finally came up with an affordable way to get the Ultravox to me. So, I was pretty excited earlier this week when a large box arrived containing... this. And inside we have an immaculate Dictaphone Ultravox, complete with the microphone and the little sheets that go on the front to indicate where your dictations start and stop, and most importantly, a sound sheet. Looking around the machine, the sound sheet is inserted onto this drum here. The record head you can position anywhere on the recording with this little knob here. You've got the volume and tone pots here, the on and off switch over there. On this side, this switch pushes a bar magnet against the sheet and completely erases it. And on the back, you've got the microphone input and a headphone output, and I think that also takes a foot switch. It turns out that the machine I bought from France doesn't actually work at the moment. The motor spins up OK, but when you use the remote switch on the microphone, nothing happens. I've had a quick look inside, and there's a capacitor that's actually blown, so that might be all it is. Anyway, I've got some capacitors on order, and I'll deal with that sometime in the future. Luckily, I've still got my original dictaphone machine that I bought all those years ago. And this one appears to work fine, so we'll give it a try in a minute. Powering the machine up, an orange neon glows over here. And the motor inside starts to spin, but nothing else happens without the remote microphone. This switch will start it playing, and also stop it. If I push it upwards, this light will glow to show it's ready to record. And again, if I hit play, that will start recording. To take it out of record mode, I just pull that switch down. 
there's a little switch on the side which at the moment is in D for dictation. If I move it to C for conference mode, it just increases the sensitivity of the microphone. The only other control I've forgotten to point out is this little lever down here. This is just a tracking adjustment for the head in case it's not quite in alignment. But you should mostly be able to leave that alone. If I move the position indicator all the way to the left, the drum will rotate to the right point to insert the sound sheet. Like this. So we'll pop the sound sheet in carefully. I've only got the one. And wind it into the machine. Really quite nice and simple. There are some notes on the dictation indicator paper that came with the sound sheet suggesting where there might be some old recordings. So we'll have a quick listen. I'll put the microphone up near the camera because that also acts as the loudspeaker and we'll see if there's anything on there. Uh, not a lot on that one. I'll try another one. Can't make out much on that one as well. I'll try the last one in case that's the one that has a little gem on it. Oh well, nothing important on there. I think we can safely record over that lot without losing any priceless treasures. Anyway, I'll move the record head to a blank space on the tape, click it up to record mode on the microphone, and move over to play, and we'll try recording something. Another feature I haven't shown yet is the record insertion point marker. If I move this across to the left, when the tape head gets to that, it operates a little switch which takes it out of record mode and starts playing again. So you can use that to insert a recording within a dictation and save the bit you want to keep. So we'll just wait for it to get to that marker and then it should start playing the last recording rather than recording over it. So it's now clicked out of record mode. And as you can hear, it's now playing a previous recording again. OK, I'll move the tape head back to the start of that recording I've just made, and we'll see what it sounds like. Another feature I haven't shown yet is the record insertion point marker. If I move this across to the left, when the tape head gets to that, it operates a little switch which takes it out of record... And that's working absolutely fine. I think the next thing we should do is try it with some music. Obviously it wasn't intended for music recording, but hey, let's give it a go anyway. 
Okay, I've brought in a slightly more up-to-date bit of music playing equipment. So we'll put it into record mode and hit play and then we'll hit play here and see how it does with music. Okay, that should do. Let's stop that, move it back to the start, and see what it sounds like. Hit play, and then we'll hit play here, and see how it does with music. Yep, that sounds pretty good really for a bit of uh, voice recording equipment. I've certainly heard worse anyway. Okay, I think now I'll take it up to the workbench and strip it apart so you can have a look at what goes on inside the machine. So now we've got the newer of the two Ultravoxes on the workbench. The main motor is here. It has a belt drive to this pulley here, which it will be spinning the whole time the machine is switched on. When you press play, the solenoid here engages the spindle of this pulley with a rubber tyre on the edge of the drum, and that makes it turn. You can see at the top here the bar magnet that's used for bulk erasing of the sound sheet. That's normally held away from the drum, and when you press the lever on the case, it's moved in contact with the sound sheet to erase it. Looking from the front of the machine, this is the insertion point marker here, with the little switch that cuts the recording when it gets to the marker. The playhead is on this carriage here, and the switch at the end here is the one that moves the drum into the right position to insert the sound sheet. Looking from the top, the circuit board takes up most of the rest of the machine. You've got the neon light here, the volume and tone pots here with the on-off switch here. The capacitor that's definitely blown is this one at the back. We'll have a closer look at that in a second. Looking at the back of the machine and comparing these two capacitors, the top of the one on the right has bulged, which is a pretty clear indication that that capacitor has failed, so I'll replace that one sometime in the future. I figured we ought to take a look at the sound sheet itself, so I'll just get it out of the machine and place it on a bit of A4 paper so you've got something to compare it to for scale. It's a thin sheet of plastic with a magnetic coating on it. It has a diagonal line across it so you can see when it's rotating on the drum. It has a rigid card top where it inserts into the drum itself and it's printed with dictaphone and Swiss made. That's more or less all there is to it. I've still only got one of these, so if you happen to find a box of them in your loft um, and you want to get rid of a few, please get in touch in the comments. Okay, that's about it for this video. If you've enjoyed watching, feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel. There'll be more vintage stuff coming soon. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in a future video.